We're showing Stanley Kubrick's groundbreaking science fiction epic, 2001, A Space Odyssey. One of the reasons it is so groundbreaking is the uh, exceptional special effects work uh, created primarily by Douglas Trumbull. Doug, I guess today. Doug, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, the interesting thing about the film, it's hard to remember 1968, how primitive special effects, especially in science fiction films, were. What were some of the new techniques developed for 2001? Well, 2001 for me, and I think for everybody on the crew, was a totally new experiment in movies. Uh, first of all, I don't want to take credit for being the guy who did all the special effects in 2001. Right. It was really quite a large crew of people, and uh, there were three other major effects coordinators on the film, supervisors. Uh, I came on the film at the age of 23 with some background in animation and cartoons, but at least it was animation that was very technical and was space animation working for a company in L.A. here called Graphic Films. And we were doing films for NASA and the Air Force about space. And one of the jobs we had in working with Con Pedersen at Graphic Films was to try to simulate the whole Apollo program before it actually happened. And I was at my little airbrush and painting little spaceships right. and spattering stars like you have on the background here, you know, with the, uh, an airbrush on a piece of glossy black paper. And, and it was really the training that got me started in uh, understanding something about special effects, but it was really just uh, animation techniques, and I was functioning as an illustrator and an artist. So I was lucky enough to be spattering stars on black paper at the right time, so right. I got a job after that working for Kubrick, and he asked me and Con Pedersen and a, and a couple of other people later on to come and work with him in London, because he was looking for anybody who had any backing in it. Now, in the 50s and 60s, primarily what we would see in a uh, science fiction or space epic would be ships moving on one plane. Uh, there was no movement in direction, changing direction specifically. But 2001 changed all of that. There was quite a maturity to the effects. Well, I think Kubrick's prime intent in 2001 was to make, I mean, it was the reason he decided to make the film at 65 millimeter Super Panavision, which was called Cinerama at the time. He wanted to make a visual epic that was nonverbal. I, I hate to paraphrase Stanley Kubrick's ob objects, right. but uh, it was in intended originally to be a work of art, to be highly visual. It was highly experimental, and uh, we had to start from square one on how to develop techniques and machinery and equipment, optical printers, and, and ways of shooting spacecraft and stars. And it was really starting from scratch in every part of it, for us and for Stanley. So we tried drilling holes in, in metal and lighting it from behind for stars. We tried spattering stars on black paper. We tried hanging little ball bearings in front of you know, black velvet. We tried everything you could think of. Hmm. So it was experimental. Everything, every aspect of the film you can think of was an experiment one way or the other. Well, but it seems like a big corporation, a research and development uh, department of a corporation. How much time went into the research before you Well. 99% 99, 99 of the time you spend on any movie, I think, is research. You know, ultimately, you come down to the take you accept. And uh, every take before that is research. Uh, in 2001, I think that the shooting ratio of how many feet of film got into the film as opposed to how many feet of film hit the cutting room floor is about 200 to 1. So there were a lot of experiments. And for every shot you see in the movie that you like, there's 199 more that didn't look quite so good. Did any of those shots that ended up on the cutting room floor maybe bring a tear to your eye? Yeah, yeah, there were a few that, that, that I had worked on, other people had worked on, that, that Stanley couldn't fit into the movie. All right, well, we'll be seeing the film in just a few minutes, and are there some things, uh, particular shots that you're in love with that you might like us to uh, be aware of before we look at the film? Well, I think the part of the film that I was principally responsible for, th at least that I'm most proud of is the Stargate sequence at the end of the film. And I wasn't even responsible for all of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, Stanley wanted this whole idea of, of this movement and penetration really into another dimension. 
it started out as a very literal idea that, that they arrived at uh, Jupiter, which was Saturn for a while, and then changed back to Jupiter. And one of the moons uh, had a hole in it, a rectangular slot in the moon. And if you looked, if you got over the moon and looked down through the slot, you would see another star system, another time zone, another something on the other side. And we actually did drawings of moons with little slots right. in them and tried to visualize that. And it all seemed to be terribly literal. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't ring true, and it didn't have any level of excitement to it. And the script called for them dropping little probes, probes down through the slot right. to see what was on the other side, and they would accelerate away and disappear. So there, and the intent was something more impressionistic than that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I got to messing around with this technique that's now called slit scan right. or streak photography, which was an outgrowth of some ideas that I had gotten from John Whitney, who was known by many filmmakers as a very uh, avant-garde cinema technician, among right. other things, and computer electronics photographer. Uh, so I experimented with this technique, just using a little Polaroid camera on the animation stand, and worked out this way of creating these corridors of light out of flat artwork. It was a, it's a very complicated technique that would take more than the show to explain. Right. But I did that, and uh, Stanley liked that very much, and then we built a huge piece of machinery, which was the most elaborate uh, technical device on the film, and started cranking out that sequence. And that sequence alone, I think from the time we started shooting till the final take on that sequence was nine months of almost continuous photography. At some times when the camera was running, it would be maybe three minutes for one frame of film. Hmm. This thing would run sometimes 36 or 48 hours continuously mm -hmm. just to make one 20 second cut. Had you any idea at that time that that would become the basis for all of ABC's promotional? <laughs> No, uh, but as a matter of fact, when I came back from 2001, I set up a small company in L.A. doing television commercials. Is that and right? And I cranked out the first Slit Scan ABC logos. Now, you uh, have obviously worked extensively in special effects. In addition to 2001, you did the effects on Close Encounters. But you also directed Silent Running. Now, let's talk a little bit about the uh, difference in being a director of a film and director of special effects. Well, it's, it's been very difficult for me to continue to function over the last 10 years as a special effects contractor, supervisor on other people's films. I mean, I, f I have a feeling about the whole of a film. And I look upon film as a very technical art form uh, that requires a, an understanding of cameras and lighting and photography. And if you really go back through the history of film, you'll find that the first filmmakers really understood it better then than most filmmakers understand it now. And uh, I'm not trying to do stage plays. I'm not trying to do television shows. I think film is a very specific thing that requires an understanding of these technical things like special effects. And if you go back into the very earliest films, they're filled with special effects. Everybody was having fun with mm -hmm. burn-ins and dissolves and mats and optical effects and hanging miniatures and paintings and all kinds of things. And I really have a lot of fun with that. I, I used to be an illustrator, and it just the whole idea that you could paint a painting and it would just sort of sit there and not move around got frustrating for me, so uh -huh. I got into making movies. But uh, I like directing. I like controlling the whole thing more. I think that, that it's possible. I think George Lucas is very good at this. Uh, and Steven Spielberg is too. Two, I think, young filmmakers who really understand best the technologies at work and how to integrate them into a story and make, and make the structure work as a whole. There are those who would say, because you are primarily a film technician, that uh, maybe there would be a lack in your ability to work with actors. How do yeah. you feel about well, that and the, the characterization? I think the town tends to try to stereotype people that way. Uh, I think they don't, they don't see it as a normal chain of events for someone who does a technical role like that to move up into an aesthetic and creative dramatic role. So it's a very hard thing for me to bridge. but. Uh, I think I've done that. I'm finally directing another film called Brainstorm for MGM this year, and right. then another film after that called Millennium. Let's talk a little about Brainstorm. What is the basis of the film? Well, it's a, it's a film about uh, the mind. It's about the human mind. It's about imagination. It's about hallucinations. It's about visions beyond reality. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's like Altered States. I'm delighted that Altered States just opened in town right. this week and is doing very good business. It's not like Altered States at all. But for me, it's an opportunity to do some very uh, unusual and bizarre special effects, which I enjoy doing, which is really things I have in my mind that I want to put on film in the structure of a dramatic film about someone having these kinds of hallucinations and imagination. And they're not space effects. And they're not space effects. I'm right. very tired of making space movies. <laughs> I think a lot of people are tired of seeing space movies right now. 
Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about 2001 briefly. Um, the film was very different from, say, Star Wars or The Empire Strikes Back or even Star Trek because they went after authenticity and reality. There is no sound in space. There's slow movement. Uh, what's the difference? What's the challenge between that and, say, a space fantasy like Star Wars? Well, see, I think a space fantasy like Star Wars has much stronger broad entertainment appeal than 2001. Mm -hmm. 2001 is like a very fine uh, impressionist painting or something as opposed to a comic book. I mean, that, maybe that's a gross difference to characterize it, but 2001 is very slow. It's very meticulous. Not to say that there were many times in the making of 2001 we didn't totally reject what the technical advisors told us mm -hmm. something had to do. But uh, 2001 went together in a certain way, just having to do with, with not just the special effects. I mean, even the sets, the props, the way scenes are acted, the way that film is dramatically structured, the way music plays against sequences. Just to see a guy running around in a centrifuge like a, like a squirrel in a cage playing you know, a piece right. of music. It's not a special effect, really. I mean, it was a big rotating set. But uh, it was a whole. It was a very particular kind of Stanley Kubrickian look right. at what he thought life might be like in the future. Well, it was quite a surprising gamble on the part of MGM to invest $10.5 million in 1968 in what <coughs> basically is a surreal intellectual film. Well, uh, for starters, they didn't know they were going to invest $10 million right. in a special effects extravaganza. I think they thought it was going to be more like three and a half. Uh, I know that uh, one of the things I heard at the beginning of the film with the special effects budget was going to be $300,000 or something. Uh, the film took the rap for spending all of its money on special effects, which isn't strictly true. I mean, everything on the film cost a lot because everything was experimental. Um, I, I don't think they knew what they were getting, but I don't think most studio executives ever know quite what they're getting. It's always a surprise. Right. You know, you know it's what's fun about the movie business. It's gambling and it's horse racing, but it's fun, and whether you're going to hit or lose is part of the fun, I think. Well, 2001, now oh, we're showing it here on television. How do you feel about that? A, a 70 millimeter roadshow film, six track stereo sound, and here it is on the small screen. What do you feel about that? Well, uh, that question really brings a, a lot of ideas to my mind about television and widescreen movies and, and what's really happening with the, the cable revolution and the disc revolution and cassettes at home and videotape recorders, which is all going to just get broader and wider and more of it. And uh, it's always disappointing to me to see something that was shot in 70 millimeter with in incredible resolution and, 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 and attention to detail that's roughly twice as wide as it is high in proportion reduced down to something that's not right. right, that can't really see over here and can't really see over here, but might have to move back and forth or really has to leave things out, uh, and that suffers from relatively low resolution compared to feature films, which is television. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it disappointing, and it's made me think a lot about what the different media are, how they work best. For instance, I think uh, uh, Close Encounters, and particularly Star Wars, will play much better on television than 2001. That's interesting. Because 2001 really has more to do with, in, with aesthetics than with drama. Mm -hmm. Drama, I think, plays very well on television. Fine aesthetics and impressionist painting. Who wants to watch them on TV? So, now, you know, you're involved in the development of some new formats for film and, uh, I guess, even television. Do you want to talk a little about how some of these are different from existing systems? Well, as part of what I was saying, uh, I'm really interested in media and how television works and how films work and why you would go to a theater or stay home and watch television. What, what's the decision-making process? And uh, I felt for one, one side of what I'm doing is that I like going to a theater, and when I go to a theater, I want it to be big and exciting. Right. And I grew up you know, right in the middle of Cinerama and Todd A.O. and VistaVision and and cinemascope and widescreen and stereo sound. I just really got excited by that. I think that's what generated my enthusiasm for making movies. And that's really what I expect when I go to a theater. I want that kind of intense showmanship. When I look at television, I feel like I want information, story, a different kind of drama, a, a right. faster pace, and a different kind of content. I think the kind of content that works in both media is really quite different. Uh, I've been working on a film process that will work for large screen theaters, mm -hmm. giant screen, 70 millimeter film, multiple soundtracks, 
uh, extremely bright images, very realistic and three-dimensional using high-speed photography. Mm -hmm. And we settled on a frame rate that's identical to the frame rate of television. Television mm -hmm. runs at 60 fields a second. Uh, and television has a unique immediacy to the image that I think people are unable usually to describe. If you see a, a movie on television cut directly against a piece of live video, there's a difference. And you right. can't quite describe what it is. What is that difference? Why does the live video seem to be more live? And what it is, is the scanning rate of television, the 60 fields a second, that there's new motion information every 60th of a second. In, in a movie, there's only new motion information every 24th of a second. So when you're seeing a... So you've matched the two formats. Yeah, so you've, if you take a normal film shot at 24 frames and put it on television, you're seeing each frame of film three times, mm -hmm. and then two times, and then three times to try to stagger it out to turn 24 into 60. Right. And so now we're not a very even number. <laughs> and, a, and a film would work, uh, provide more clarity on television? Yeah, we took uh, this film process I'm working with, which is designed for extremely widescreen motion pictures in theaters, but at 60 frames a second. If you take each of those frames and transfer it to a field of video, you get television that looks better than television. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really a really interesting. interesting process, and I hope to see more of it. And we're looking forward to Brainstorm and Millennium. And right now, 2001. Doug Trumbull, thanks a lot for Thank being you. with Thank you. I hope it looks great. <laughs>